that's it. Okay, so welcome everybody <clears throat> to this uh, third uh, webinar of the European Distance Learning Week organized by EDEN. Um, today we are focusing on uh, uh, open education and uh, we have, uh, we can see here in the, in the videos, the four presenters of the day that I will introduce in a moment. Can I, can I get my slides so I can sh show the agenda? And um, basically the, the idea of today is to tackle the issue of open education that, as you know, is uh, its different uh, declinations, being OER, MOOCs, uh, open educational practices, is pretty present in all uh, conference uh, all over Europe and beyond, uh, at least in Eden is very much present uh, across the whole conference. Uh, the idea of this webinar is to, uh, uh, not really, the, the other one, yes. Uh, well, the idea of the webinar is basically to uh, tackle this issue from three perspectives, which are <clears throat> the three perspectives that count in our understanding, that are the perspective of the, the, the teacher, the professor, the, the instructor, so that is the micro uh, level. Then we have a meso level at the level of the, of the organization, so typically the university leaders and university managers, and finally the policy perspectives. One of our uh, well, one of my beliefs, uh, which is shared by a number of colleagues, is that these three levels often do not talk to each other. So sometimes policy is not really working as it should. Sometimes you have innovators that are not recognized by the middle level. So there is something going on between and among these uh, these three levels. And the idea of this webinar is, uh, first of all, to receive uh, uh, some presentations by representatives sort of these three levels, and then to have a discussion on um, to have a discussion among these, these different levels, sort of. So we will start, first of all, by a contextual presentation by Andrea Namorato dos Santos from the JRC in Seville, the Research Center of the European Commission. They, did a lot of, they are doing a lot of work on open education, trying to frame, what, frame it, sort of, especially in higher education. I think it's very valuable work. Thank you, Andrea, for being with us and uh, providing this first framework. And then we will go with uh, Blazenka first, uh, then Lisa Marie, and then Alan, with the three levels, micro, uh, meso, and, uh, and macro. The idea is to have 15 minutes uh, <coughs> for every presentation, uh, after which, uh, uh, after 30 minutes, I will reappear on the screen to, to let you know that time is almost over. And uh, then, in the meantime, participants can use the chat to, to pose uh, questions or comments to that presentation that I will try then to, to pose to the, the, the speaker of that presentation. And then at the end, if you're good in keeping the time, we will be able to have some 20 minutes discussion where I will have back the, the four speakers in a sort of a virtual panel to discuss both with the, with the participants through the chat and among themselves. Basically, the main question is how could we, what could we do, what should be done to make uh, these three levels uh, um, work better together, let's say, and interact better. What what would be the the main barriers and the actions to be to be taken? Um, yeah, uh, Christina, can I have Andreas uh, slides so that we can start right away? So basically, participants uh, can use the chat for questions, comments, and uh, any doubt. Um, and then I will try to facilitate <clears throat> the, the responses from, uh, from the speakers. So I will now close the, the speaker's windows. I hope you can so to leave only Andrea speaking. So Andrea, the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Thanks very much, Fabio. Hello, everyone, uh, my colleagues, speakers, and participants. It's a pleasure to be here uh, today, having received this uh, invitation from Eden you know, uh, at the uh, European Distance Learning Week. I'm here presenting uh, on behalf of my team uh, of the work we do here and also of uh, IFUNI, our project leader here at the JRC. As Fabio mentioned, uh, we are the European Commission's uh, in house. Science Institute, and we carry out research in the field of education, but we actually 
do not um, make policies here. This is just a clarification. We try and have research, we carry out research to provide evidence to help policymakers, both at the European Commission level uh, and also at the member states level. Okay? This work I'm, pre I'm presenting today is, is a work that we carried out on behalf of DG uh, Education and Culture, DG EAC. Um, I've been asked to talk about um, open education in a broad way, uh, particularly uh, in, in the European agen agenda, how it appears in the European agenda of policy, let's say, and, and mostly to discuss a little bit our understanding of the concept of open education, what we mean, what's the working definition that we have of open education. So first of all, this work that I'm showing today has started in September 2013, the Open Edu project, it's part of the, the Open Edu project, and it was designed, designed especially to support the communication passed by the Commission then opening up education. But it, it also touches upon uh, at different um, uh, policy levels, as for example the European and Training ET 2020 policy priorities. There are six important priorities and priority number three, I'll read for you, is open in and innovative education and training, including by fully embracing the digital era. So this work is also uh, relevant to, to help achieve policy priorities in the EU, being open education an important one. So the first thing is to ask the question, what is open education? And I'm sure that if you go around and ask uh, your colleagues, your students, what open education means, you're going to hear different answers. At least this is what happened to us when we asked many, many different people from different profiles from different countries in the EU, and some people would relate open education to uh, open educational resources, to OER, for example, uh, because it's, it's a very popular term, it's a very popular concept. There are many universities and teachers working towards opening up resources uh, by means of using open licenses. So some people would equal open, open education to OER. Others would first think of MOOCs, for example, which are becoming extremely popular in universities as well. Um, but quite often, uh, there wasn't much this perspective that open education has evolved over time as a term, you know, as, as a way of carrying out education itself. It's not a new term, it dates back from the 70s, uh, and with the advance of technologies for teaching and learning, let's say, open education has been evolving and has become, let's say, a way of carrying out education more in the digital way. Um, and, and this is what we tried uh, and show a little bit in this working definition that we've uh, that we've created. This definition has been uh, discussed with a lot of experts here uh, at GRC in Seville, uh, both from uh, rectors from universities and also from, with the open education experts via online wikis. Um, so we try to make it a very broad, like an umbrella term, open education, which would accommodate uh, below it, a number of other small definitions or different ways of looking at open education, let's say, whether focusing on OER, on MOOCs, on accessibility, on, on access in different ways, on free of charge content, but most importantly, I think, for us is to, um, to focus uh, on the fact that open education helps bridging formal and non-formal learning, so recognition is a very important part of open education in our view, but also we wanted to move beyond uh, the concept that uh, open education and OER are, are synonyms. We, we take the perspective they are not. Open education, open educational resources are extremely important in open education, but they are part of it, as well as many other dimensions which I'll show you in a minute, okay? So, uh, moving on. The Open Edu project, just very briefly, as I mentioned, uh, is a research study that we, we have already published, many reports, I'll show you in a minute. But just to give you a perspective from the research side, we carried out research in EU member states, uh, both in qualitative ways and quantitative ways in order to gather information from universities 
So it focuses on higher education, on their perspectives, uh, whether they are offering open education or not, and if so, how, in what format, what uh, is their understanding, whether they are working on, towards recognition of non-formal learning, and collecting all this qualitative and quantitative information that I show you in the diagram in there from all these uh, sub-studies of the project, we then develop to the framework, okay? So, important facts from surveys, which is part of the open survey without. This is just for us to position a little bit, this, let's say, somehow the state of the art, as far as we know, of open education in Europe. But just remembering this, date, this data, it's back from the, the end of 2015. We only published it this year, but the research was carried out in 2015. So, on a survey of five countries, 23% of universities claim to have had some financial benefits with open education. Because many people ask, so open education, why should I be doing it? What would I gain? And yes, some universities have developed a strategy and a model in which they say, more student reach actually increases enrollment. We manage to get a lot of external funding and also even generate a small income. So it's something to think about. Then, 51.4% of these universities in these five countries which is, this is a representative survey, argue uh, they use open educational resources, which seems really good. It, it's more than, than half. Um, but 35.2 develop and offer OER. So it clearly means some of them, most of them use, but not of them really are very engaged in producing um, and, and offering, which is interesting. This can be debatable, but this is what came out from our survey. Then, 42.5% of these universities in these five countries offer MOOCs as part of their institution's educational strategy. And this whole work is about a strategy, uh, thinking whether a, the university has a strategy or not, and whether it would be beneficial to have uh, an open education strategy instead of just having isolated practices to offer open education in one faculty or another. Interestingly, uh, uh, nearly 50% say they, they, it's part of their educational strategy. Uh, but only 32.2% mention open education as a policy or have a, a proper institutional policy or mention open education in their mission statement. Okay, So we argue that open education should go beyond uh, isolated practices and actually be part of the institution's strategic and mission statement. Uh, and to finalize, uh, I also put the data where you can find further information on this. Collaboration in MOOC recognition, because we think it's a, it's a big step forward, talking about the recognition dimension. 41.4% uh, of these universities say they collaborate nationally to recognize MOOC certificates. And interestingly, 3.9% do collaborate cross-border. What do we understand from this? There is a lot of, of uh, still uh, lack of transparency on how we do things, you know, making it clear within the institution and communicating it to the world and to the other institutions. And we tend to think that the lack of transparency in certain university practices and a strategy makes collaboration opportunities less visible. Right? So this is one of the findings that we had in our study. So this framework that I'm going to show you uh, is, was designed to work as a tool. It does not bring full definitive answers to everything, but it was designed to work as a tool to help uh, uh, um, um, policymakers at an institutional level to design policies for open, for open education. So basically, it is a guide to help people to think through critical questions and, and then to engage with this framework in order to come up with both assessing their own institution um, uh, both assessing their own institutions, but also uh, um, try and design strategies. Sorry, is this is this for me that, that the voice is echoed? I'll I'll carry on, but I'm afraid um, I can I'm hear afraid you, but... there's nothing else I can do about yeah, it. Yeah, I can hear you very well. Andrea. Okay, because I've received uh, I've received messages that my voice is not very clear, yeah. and I apologize. Um, but I'll carry on. Yeah, yeah. So... All is fine. It seems okay, it was a perfect. problem. Okay, perfect. Thank you. 
Thanks. Okay, so here's the framework, okay? Um, um, these are the 10 dimensions that we've identified, and you may ask me, but Andrea, where is OER? You know, where are MOOCs? They are included in the content dimension of the framework, okay? So this is the visual representation of the framework. Imagine that if you were to go inside of each of these dimensions, you would find, and you will find, further information in each one of them, okay? So the six uh, dimensions in the center, we call them the core dimensions, and the four dimensions outwards, we call them the transversal dimensions, that dimensions. Remembering that um, they do not work in isolation, they are dependent upon each other, they have like, let's say, an interdiscursive relation to one another. Um, but then we, we, we bring them uh, to the front of open education in order to to prompt thinking, you know, what is my university doing toward, towards recognition and collaboration and try and bring and move it a little bit uh, away of staying in the same discourse of equa equating open education to open access or OER only. They are extremely important parts, but there could be more and we could reach much, much more our goal of modernizing higher education if you were to think more in terms of this holistic way of open education. Okay, the framework, as I said, presents a definition for the dimension, a rationale, components, and over 150 descriptors in each of these dimensions that you can look at and, and think of the, all possible practices that you or your university can take towards open education. As I mentioned, it's dynamic. The university can, can adapt it, can reuse it, can choose which dimensions to work with, and can customize the framework. But I think the most important thing is that by engaging with the framework, um, is, uh, the idea is that it would help to uh, think about and perhaps even restructure strategic actions at a, a broader university level on open education. Here's an example of what you can find in the report in terms of the content dimension, just a sample, no? So we have a definition for content and then we explore what we mean and then we talk about OER and then we talk about free of charge content. We think OER is extremely important. Uh, we do uh, suggest and uh, understand the importance that content in open education is fully open licensed to enable reuse, sharing, etc. But we also acknowledge that in our research, Free of charge content that is not uh, licensed, openly licensed, but is open to the learner, uh, still appears a lot in practice. And we could not ignore that fact and leave it out. And this is why we put it here. We consider free of charge content also part of open education. It's contributing to opening up access to education, although we do try and stress the importance of making this content open licensed whenever possible. Okay, thank you. So again, here are how, are how the descriptors appear. Um, so university could use this checklist, for, for example, to say this interests me, this does not interest me, so on and so forth. At the end of the report, we have a strategic planning template also to help uh, this thinking through these questions, okay? So these are some of our, our reports. The only one missing there is the open cases report. Um, but all of these have already been published. The middle one is the open survey that I showed you before. The first one is about validation of learning, and we're going to talk about this on the webinar tomorrow. Um, and the last one on the right is the opening up education report in which we present the open edu framework. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please uh, just ask them. Well, thank you very much, Andrea. That was absolutely in time and uh, on time and uh, very, very precise. Uh, well, a quick comment on my side. I think this, uh, this, this whole work you are doing uh, through these multiple research uh, efforts is basically, correct me if I'm wrong, is basically aiming an, at opening up the, the perception that people have of open education, so at providing a, a holistic view. I mean, uh, a more, um, I would say, uh, a broader view that touches upon practically all the dimensions, I would say, of a university life. And um, my, I have a, just a question, quick question. You, you mentioned the strategic planning template, and also Lisa Marie is asking if they are available in the report. So are you aware of any university who has already used this or is planning to do so? 
or uh, is it is maybe too early? Uh, okay, this is a very good question, um, Fabio. Thanks for asking because quite often we forget to mention about this template. But it's actually just a roadmap. It's just a guide to help people interact with the framework and its descriptors. Um, because this framework has only been published recently in August, which was even during a vacation period, uh, we don't know yet of any university that is, let's say, using it or, or piloting it. I could even say that because this, this framework is, is a product of research, so it's very theoretical, but we would really like to see how it works in practice. Uh, even you know, in order to, to have feedback and, and to see if it's really helpful. So to date, I don't have, um, I don't know of any university that is uh, actually using the template itself, but I'm sure that some of them were considering it, were discussing it at a higher level at the university, and may be using it shortly. Okay. <clears throat> well, in fact, uh, Lisa Marie later on will, uh, will present uh, the issue of open education from an institutional strategy perspective, so maybe she will have some, uh, some comments and some possible views on that. Uh, Lisa Marie has a question on, um, on that. Uh, perhaps MOOCs uh, uh, could, be, could be considered a platform slash channel used to realize the 10 dimensions. So MOOCs as a transversal uh, platform, I would say, a channel. To, to develop all the dimension, or do you see MOOCs uh, limited to the content area? The content. Actually, no, because we do talk about MOOCs in more than the content dimension. Uh, but I think you're right. As I mentioned before, there is an interdiscursive relation between all these dimensions. They depend upon each other. So yes, MOOC as a platform, so MOOC as technology, definitely, as a way of changing pedagogical practices, definitely, as a way of uh, sharing content and even um, creating content with the learners' interaction, definitely, as a way of collaborating, uh, even in terms of recognition, collaborating with other universities, as I mentioned before, definitely, as a way of uh, carrying out research, of increasing access. So indeed, I think MOOCs can indeed yeah. touch upon all the yeah, The same is true for OER. Seeing. I mean, I see OER as a transversal issue more than something limited on content, but uh, I mean, you know, you know my opinion on this uh, on this effort, this majestic effort we're trying to do to open up the vision. So, congratulations from my side. Uh, I don't know if there are other comments. Uh, we still have time also during the to, to think of questions um, for for Andrea. Did I skip anything? I don't think so. We have Alan typing. <clears throat> Okay, uh, good. So, uh, thank you very much again, Andrea. We'll uh, we'll see you again in the, in the final panel. Now I'm asking Blazenka to appear uh, visually and uh, um, in terms of sound on the screen, because now we are starting with. Yeah. Just to say, I've also shared this slide. Uh, it's in slide share for anyone who wants to have access Perfect. to these slides. Perfect. Thank also. you. And it, they will be also in the Eden uh, in the Eden platform. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay, now we move to the first, uh, I would say, critical dimension, possibly, in my understanding, one of the most critical, that is the, the dimension of the, the micro dimension. So how are teachers, how are IT support staff, how are uh, even student representatives dealing with the issue of opening education, opening up education, which, as we heard, is not only about, uh, uh, is much more than just applying an open license for as much as this can be important, but touches upon really many, I would say, in all the dimensions, uh, including finance, of uh, the life, the daily life of, for example, a professor. So we will hear on a case from uh, Croatia. Uh, we have uh, Blazenka Divjak from the University of Zagreb with us, with uh, a repropo reproposing a, a presentation from a paper which won the best research paper award in the last Eden Research Workshop in Oldenburg. So congratulations to Blazenka and to your colleague Antonia that cannot be with us today. Uh, Blazenka, can we see you on the screen? <clears throat> I'm here, I'm just waiting. Good afternoon. Yeah. Happy to be on a webinar. I'm just waiting for my slides to appear, but... Uh... I, I think they are there. Okay. These are... Okay, okay, good, good, thank you. Are they? Yes. Thank you. Can you come over on the screen? Um, I'm available because my camera is working. I think that we're just waiting for 
the technical side from your side from Eden to start. Okay, maybe you should click up there to make it green. Ah, oh, yes. There you are. So 15 minutes also for you. The floor is yours and thanks and congratulations again for the best research paper award. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in this webinar. I think that it's a very uh, interesting topic, but also uh, that we have a lot of work to do and to explore further. What I'm going to present uh, today it is uh, how we use MOOCs in traditional classrooms in a way of blended learning um, approach. That is a joint work I, um, I did with my PhD student, Antonia Bralic. As Fabio said, uh, she she she's uh, ill today, so she she's not present. That's a pity because she really did a lot of work in um, on uh, research in this on this paper. But I'll try to make it up for you uh, working through this presentation. So um, what I'm trying to do um, it is to describe how we use uh, massive open online courses that was initially designed as a, a standalone product, but we tried to in incorporate this uh, approach into the blended learning uh, program in a traditional face-to-face -face learning. So um, not to, to supplement a traditional uh, learning course, but to use it as a tool to achieve certain learning outcomes for, especially for target, uh, special targeted here part-time students. So uh, there are a lot of benefits uh, of incorporating MOOCs into the traditional, traditionally thought course, thought course, replacing lectures, augmenting or replacing secondary materials or some filling gaps in expertise. For example, if you have some special, special issue or some uh, rather hard learning outcomes for some, some uh, teachers or students, then uh, exposing students to other styles of teaching um, and classroom discussion as well, um, or putting some accent on some generic skills uh, or um, teaching students how to uh, teach or learn online. So that's, that was uh, our goal, almost all of them. And um, of course, we were aware of the downsides of MOOCs like a pass, uh, pass rate or some, some other issues uh, that we that we can find in literature. Um, what we did, I'm trying to describe a case study. So we incorporated uh, MOOCs into the uh, teaching and learning in a uh, course in the course discrete mathematics with graph theory. That is course that is uh, uh, taught in the first year of master level of study programs information system and software engineering at the University of Zagreb, Faculty of Organization and Informatics. Each year we have around 100 uh, students and uh, we have a mixture of uh, full-time and part-time students. So between uh, 80, 90 and 90 percent of students are full-time students, so uh, able to participate it physically in classes and the rest are part-time students and uh, almost all of them actually are working. So for them it's quite difficult to follow uh, uh, classroom activities or uh, some uh, classroom work or uh, project work. So um, how we started, we uh, started to, uh, our planning with constructive alliance. Uh, we tried to align um, learning outcomes of the course with the uh, teaching and uh, learning methods, uh, assessment methods, and also um, to assess uh, student workload uh, to incorporate it in this model. What's interesting that, of course, we have um, between, uh, I think that we have eight learning outcomes, but two learning outcomes are connected to the use, uh, how we use MOOCs in, the, in this course. So the first learning outcome uh, here, it is solve real world problems in ICT with methods from graph theory and discrete mathematics individually and in collaboration in teams. And that the second, use mathematical literature for multiple s uh, sources, at least one tool for processing mathematical language and, uh, and learning system having specific characteristic, uh, characteristics of mathematics in mind. So uh, uh, if you look at these two learning outcomes, we, um, we use uh, two different teaching and learning methods 
for, for these two learning outcomes. First one is student work in teams of three on posing and solving authentic problems. And uh, usually uh, there are uh, three or four at most four students together uh, first um, posing and then solving some authentic problems by the use of algorithms and the theory from the, from the course. But what we noticed that for the part-time students it's quite difficult to participate in this team work so we try to find some alternative for them and uh, this alternative uh, is that student can participate in selected MOOCs. Um, we use uh, usually MOOCs on, on Coursera. And then after that in assessment part uh, for the first method, method of teaching and then assessment this project work teacher assessed and mm, the work but also there there is a peer assessment of problem solving based on prepared criteria and scoring rubrics we also um, try to develop uh, alternative um, alternative assessment for for those students that participate in selected MOOCs and what we use we look at the performance their performance in MOOCs that uh, is 90% of a final grade then uh, students are obliged to uh, carry on with the diary and learning uh, learning diary and we analyze the diary, diary and students pre uh, present what they learned uh, uh, in MOOCs in particular MOOCs to other students that's all together is 10% uh, of the final grade what is also critical it is um, to um, evaluate and look at the student workload so we calculated that approximately it, uh, it is one and a half uh, ECTS, so 20% of the course, because the course is seven ECTS altogether. And then uh, it means that we uh, have to find MOOCs that uh, approximately, um, uh, approximately have 40 working hours. And I think it was really critical. And also we, add, uh, we added this uh, 20 hours coming from the, uh, the second learning outcomes so the use of literature or multiple sources for learning um, learning and then what we do so far so we why we actually just to wrap it out why we use MOOCs first to expose students to more online learning experience and secondly to help part-time students in meeting the course learning outcome how we do it we use, as I said, Coursera, uh, Coursera courses. Um, in two years, this year is the third year we uh, use this approach. At first, we started to use it in a way that students uh, can um, choose their own um, course on Coursera connected to the um, discrete mathematics or graph theory. But of course, teacher should approve the, uh, the choice. Um, then, because of some of some difficulties, we uh, change a little bit in the academic year 2015-16 uh, in a way that we uh, pre-selected a dozen, 12, I think it was the number, it was uh, 12 Coursera courses, and then students um, choose which course to uh, to cover up. Um, and I think it was uh, better the second year, and this is the this year is the third year we use this approach. What also the students are um, uh, supposed to do it is to to write learning diary, and not just diary how they are uh, learning and what they, are, they learn, but also to answer eight questions. You can see the questions on the slide and the details you can find in the article that was uh, presented on a, a research workshop in Oldenburg and it's available online so you can check on details. Uh, these uh, eight questions uh, uh, we, we post in order to capture students experience and um, to give us also opportunity to have some kind of a follow-up uh, qualitative analysis of the our uh, our work and what we can what we can change so um, these are uh, three research questions we asked uh, asked ourselves so the first one can use of MOOCs 
help in giving students positive learning experience in vir virtual environment and help part-time students in achieving particular learning outcomes. So we are very much oriented to achieving learning outcomes. Then second, how to align course learning outcomes and student workload with use of MOOCs in a specific course. So to do it in a uh, way to ensure that the learning outcomes can be achieved. And the third one, uh, what are the main challenges for students in using MOOCs? Now, I, I noted here that, is, um, that Antonia was supposed to follow this, but now I'm going to cover the rest. So, of course, we look at the literature, and you can find in our, um, our paper, a read a, uh, I think, a really good literature review on how uh, MOOCs are used in different courses, not to recognize the whole MOOC on a program level, but to use um, in an innovative way um, MOOCs in courses to substitute or to uh, develop certain, um, certain uh, skills for students. So this is a, a quick overview of um, quantitative analysis, how successful students are uh, that choose MOOCs in comparison with those who work on projects. You can see that uh, in the first academic year, here we have, um, let me find, oh yeah, it's here. So you, you can see here that the first year we have 107 enrolled students and um, 28 female students because this is a study of informatics. We are predominantly, we have predominantly male students even though we are trying a lot to attract more female students. Then nine uh, students choose MOOCs and other students, the rest of students work on um, uh, project related activities. And then um, uh, the second academic year that were um, 22 students uh, that were choosing MOOC, MOOCs and I think it's a, it's a good development. And here you can see what are the percentage of students uh, each year, but also what are the average final grade of students who completed a MOOC here in comparison with those uh, who completed project work. And we can see that um, on average these, um, these achievements are rather similar. I, we think that is uh, actually good results, that it seems that we have um, plan it uh, in, a, in a feasible way and give our students opportunity to have some alternative but not to jeopardize the results. And then uh, finally you can see here the average evaluation of MOOCs related tasks by teachers. Uh, but uh, more important uh, I think development and analysis is uh, qualitative because uh, we try to answer uh, questions and especially research questions we, um, I, I read it uh, before. So first of all, uh, connection between MOOCs and the course. So students um, commented how the, what they learned is connected to the course and um, even though most of them are not very familiar with the concept of learning outcomes, they can recognize similarities but also they, uh, they can recognize what are opportunities for them to deepen their knowledge or to work in different learning environments. They also, um, these uh, are the comments from the learning uh, diary. So you can see here that some of them uh, said that I was skeptical because of the uh, l language barrier or I like this way of learning because in addition to learning itself, I had a chance to practice my English skills and to think about this topic in English. Uh, or we can see some more comments here experience with using MOOCs and one student uh, said uh, as I was going through the course uh, I selected I have also browsed through the platform and detected several other courses I plan to take so we think that it's also some kind of um, uh, advertising uh, learning or a lifelong learning for our students 
then the entire experience is very positive. This is the first time, but definitely not the last time for me to, to use these open educational resources. Some of them also said that um, it would be good to have a specific course as a task rather than having uh, being given the option to choose any course. That was the reason why we, uh, why we opted uh, for the second year to pre-select courses. There, there are also some other uh, some other comments, you can read it, because uh, this uh, this paper, but also the presentation will, will be available. And I'm just going to, yeah, that's also very important because we ask um, about time they uh, require to successfully complete the, uh, the MOOC. And I think it was crucial because um, since we incorporated uh, MOOC into our um, traditionally uh, traditional course, it was very important to adjust these uh, hours to complete the, the course with what uh, we expected uh, from the students that um, are participated in face-to-face -face activities, and these answers uh, answers also were positive. Um, also, if you look at the challenging the challenges, um, first is English language, but it was positive and negative as well. You can read it in, in comments. But also there are uh, several comments on uh, how students uh, should have some kind of a metacognitive skills to learn, to know how to learn and what kind of a, um, how to sort out all these experiences and tasks. And finally, <coughs> if you look at the Results. So uh, we conclude that um, that um, fine tuning with learning outcomes, assessment methods, and students' workload was absolutely necessary. Then the student uh, students' prior knowledge and possible language barriers to be has to be taken have to be taken into a consideration. Then then intended learning outcomes were not always recognized by students, but uh, uh, we have to work a little bit more on explaining, explaining to our students what's going on. Then uh, the main challenges for students were language barrier, then importance of previous uh, knowledge, especially in mathematics and programming. Then a more frequent knowledge and skill assessment, and also self-motivation and completing tasks in time was crucial for them. So this model is a learning-based model. And uh, what we can say that this MOOC implementation uh, was successful, alternative to project work, and we are going to keep it and follow up what, uh, what our students' experiences and also try to upgrade it. Yes, and, yes, uh, more or less, we're still on time. Thank you very much. And uh, a virtual clap to, to you also, Blazenka. This was uh, very interesting, and my understanding shows that if properly integrated uh, and, uh, I mean, in, uh, in uh, classical, in traditional uh, courses, MOOCs uh, can have uh, absolutely a, a definitive impact, like Andrea was saying, I mean, opening up the mind of students and, uh, you know, teaching transversal skills, uh, and uh, including, including language, of course, uh, which uh, becomes very important. I pick up a question by Pedro, who asks, uh, how many students uh, uh, choose MOOCs who were part-time students, more or less? Uh, yeah, uh, all okay. of all of part-time students actually uh, were choosing MOOCs. So uh, we strongly recommend for, to those students to choose MOOCs. And uh, the first year, uh, let's say probably, I think that two or three students, uh, part-time students, didn't choose MOOCs. All all of them actually choose choose MOOCs. And um, in the second okay. year, all of part-time students uh, choose MOOCs. And another question by Alan. Is additional time spent on creating MOOC managed within costs, of course? You mean, you mean with, yeah. So we use, we use MOOCs that, uh, that are available uh, on Coursera platform. We just pre-selected these MOOCs and um, uh, approach to our students and ask them to uh, look at them and choose 
though uh, the MOOC that is more much more in line with um, uh, their interests, but it should be connected to the content and learning outcomes of the of the course. And what is also important um, uh, that we try to, and it was not always easy, uh, try to put MOOC into the time frame uh, of the course. Uh, this uh, discrete mathematics course that we that we have, so in the winter semester, so it was also one of these problems. But as I said, we didn't create it, but we just use, use okay, what we thank have you. online. Andrea and is asking really if the, stu whether the student uh, has finished her PhD and this research is published. Yes, Jude, um, Antonia, she's, she is working on her PhD and uh, she is working in the scope of the pro project. It is, you can see it here at the sub uh, in the footer here. So it was a project so-called Higher Decision Project that was supported by Croatian um, Science Foundation. And um, as I said, she's not uh, finished the PhD, but the, the, this work um, is available online in um, a proceeding that was published as a follow-up of the um, uh, research, Eden Research Workshop in Oldenburg. We are, uh, we are going to also look at the data from this year and um, yeah. um, upgrade the article. But yeah. right and now, I suggest, I mean, you have much more details in the paper. I suggest you, you read article. it. It's uh, pretty, very well done. Last question by Pedro. Did you compare the final grades between students using MOOCs and using projects? <coughs> Yeah, that's, that's what, what we have here. And you can see on one of these slides, let me just find it, that we, um, you can see here average final grade uh, of students who completed a MOOC. And this is the average final grade of students who completed a project work. You can see here that at the first year, um, it was um, uh, the students who completed the MOOC as um, lower final grade than those who completed the project work, but the next year it was a bit uh, higher. But So the second year we, uh, as I said, we upgraded a little bit our approach, pre-selected courses, give much more uh, explanation to our students, and if you look at the final, uh, final grades that are very similar. Of course, we, it, these are the small numbers that were just 22 students who choose MOOCs and um, 80 uh, out of 88, but still. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much close. again. I think we should thank now move to the meso level. In fact, uh, uh, my my question for you, I keep it for the, for the end because it has to do with the way uh, the, your institution has reacted to this. Because if I understand well, this was an initiative by by. At the micro, le the micro level, so by some professors, some researchers. So don't answer now. Let's see first what Lisa has to tell us about uh, uh, strategies for for um, adopting openness. Let's say, and uh, so um, at the mo this moment, uh, uh, yes, um, reading here we are having this uh, contribution by Lisa Marie Blanske, Eden Vice President and program director at the University of Oldenburg. So um, we are now moving to the level of uh, the institution. So how are institutions dealing with uh, the issue of openness, uh, either with strategies, with vision, with missions, but you will tell us more. So the floor is yours. Uh, I think we are coping quite well with the delay and we still have 20 participants coming and going, so I'm quite satisfied. So please, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Fabio. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about open educational resources and some research that I did last year on uh, strategies and developing an OER strategy. Um, but first, I want to start out with why strategy is important. This was a comment that was made in a Commonwealth of, of Learning publication um, last year regarding the role of distance education uh, institutions. Um, by Ashwa Kanva, who is the COL president and CEO. Um, and what she talks about in this, um, in this statement is basically that um, distance learning institutions are not taking a strong leadership role uh, in the OER movement and uh, in developing MOOCs. 
uh, and that we need to take a much stronger role in um, defining how we strategize uh, and to, to really be stronger leaders within the open um, educational resource movement. Um, and what I'd like to present to you today are three case studies that I did uh, looking at um, three institutions, three distance learning institutions, Athabasca University in Canada, uh, the Open University UK uh, in the United Kingdom, and uh, the last one, uh, the University of Maryland in the United States. So the first, um, the, oh gosh, you probably can't read these very well, can you? Um, the first, the first um, institution that I looked at was Athabasca University, which is the home of Commonwealth of Learning uh, and also the UNESCO Chair of the OER. And within their mission, Athabasca has openness as part of their mission, and that's removing barriers uh, to restrict access and, and basically giving, giving education to learners worldwide. Now, the way that they've, they've done this is um, they've <clears throat> A second. I'm having trouble reading my own slides too. Um, I will put up a better version of this later so that you can read this. Uh, their goal in adopting an OER strategy was to lower costs and to improve delivery across the institution. And they did this by using teams of learning designers, subject matter experts, and visual designers uh, and champions within the organization. Now they have a real ad hoc strategy. There's no official strategy that was defined by the institution uh, in, in determining how they would adopt OERs, um, but they did, um, but they did, but, it, but leadership within the institution was very supportive of the movement and has been very supportive of the movement, even though there is no official strategy on how they will proceed. Now, some of the results that came out of um, adopting OER within the institution, uh, there were an increased number of OER that were being used. Uh, there was increased awareness about OER, and uh, there was more use of open access uh, publishing within the institution using Open Library and, and the AU Press. Uh, they also found that the faculty was collaborating more, not just within the institution, but also with others outside of the institution as they began to explore OER. Um, another goal of Athabasca was to reduce their dependency on commercial publishing, publishers, which was uh, also a benefit that emerged from using OER at the institution. I, I apologize for these slides. I don't know the version that I had, um, had uh, you were able to read the slides, so I'm, I apologize for that. Um, now the next university that I looked at was the University of Maryland University College, uh, which was the winner of the Open Educational Consortium 2015 President's Award for its work uh, on OER. And the mission of the University of Maryland is to improve the lives of adult learners, um, and they have some specific core values which relate to openness. Now, they had a different reason for proceeding um, and, and you know, realizing an OER strategy, which was really they wanted to reduce the textbook costs um, for students. And so there's over 84,000 students at the university. And they wanted to really um, reduce that, that, that cost that was, uh, you know, that, that students had to deal with. In the United States, it's, it's a hugely, um, it's, it's a huge cost. Uh, some estimated at 25, 20, 26% of, of, um, of your average education is just with textbook costs. Uh, and so what they did was they decided to move all of their, um, move all of their textbooks um, and to use OER. Now they had a different definition of openness as other institute, as, as for example um, Athabasca did, uh, in the sense that OER was for them. Uh, they didn't necessarily uh, fall underneath David Wiley's five R's. Um, it was it's it's really about um, making it accessible online, so students would be able to access it even if it were available, for example, through the library. Uh, so they're still using publishers. Um, uh, that, and using uh, library facilities. Now what they did um, in realizing their OER strategy was they cr also created teams uh, where they had instructional designers and library personnel who worked together with faculty. Uh, the um, OER movement was strongly supported by management and pushed by management. Uh, and then together they were able to move all of their, um, basically transition all of their courses uh, into using OERs. 
Now, the results of that, 700 plus courses have transitioned to OER. It's even more uh, since this, uh, since this, uh, since I did this research because the graduate school has also moved to OER, uh, and they've saved over 10 million U.S. dollars uh, in textbook cost savings for students. Um, and this is this is tremendous. This is a tremendous benefit. It has also uh, given them a competitive advantage within the field uh, because they are able to say we'll reduce the cost of your education uh, by because you won't have to buy textbooks. Another benefit that emerged um, from the shift to OER and which has also been found within the lit literature uh, is that there was a more learner-centered curriculum. Uh, what happened was. Um, as instructors began to move to OER, they found that, that what they had to do was really, they couldn't just grab a book from somewhere and use it uh, for the courses. What they had to do was really think about, um, you know, what do our students want to learn? What kind of outcomes do I want to achieve? And then what kind of uh, uh, text can I use? What's available out there to, to help support to realize those, those outcomes? So that was uh, the second example. Now, the third example was uh, the OU UK, and I, I, I particularly like this example uh, because they used, um, because they really approached it from a, from a, from a, a holistic perspective. Uh, and their goal within, uh, with their OER strategy, uh, which was um, funded by the Hewlett Packard um, organization, was to expand their market outreach. Uh, and to increase OER production. And they really want, they saw it as an opportunity for them to really be disruptive in terms of innovation. And just like the other uh, examples that I've talked about uh, today, they, they worked with teams um, in, in looking at where can we add value? When, where can we do this across the value chain of education? They didn't just look at, you know, how can we do this from a pedagogical perspective? How can we do this from a content or technological perspective? Um, I think they really used those dimensions that Andrea talked about in her presentation uh, to look at, you know, how can we realize OER uh, within, uh, within our organization? Well, the results of, of their uh, particular strategy, and they do have a strategy, and it's, and it's uh, up on the web uh, with, an o, with their OER policy. Uh, they, had well, they had a defined um, policy and how, how OER were going to be positioned within the institution. Uh, they've converted 1,000 informal learners to actual paying students uh, within the university. And they've also found that there was a, that there was a greater brand impact uh, and more income as a result of, of using OER. Um, you know, so those were some of the results. Benefits, um, the number of benefits were, def were identified by the interviewee that, that I spoke with. Uh, they were able to increase access. Um, there was lots of reuse of, of the different um, OER uh, within the organization. They also came up with some new business models and uh, new partnerships as a result and saw also more opportunities for collaboration outside of the organization and also for research. What were some of the similarities um, across the institutions? Well, I also meant context was, was really key. Uh, because each of the institutions approached OER and using OER for different reasons. The Athabasca, um, they were driven more by having the chair within Athabasca. They wanted to get away from, um, they wanted to get away from publishers, uh, publishers, uh, the textbook publishers, and, and, you know, UMUC wanted to save money for students. Uh, whereas I think the OU was more looking at, you know, how can we really add value across the, the, the value chain? Uh, but all, but, but uh, within their strategies, there were, there were three elements that were very important, uh, which they defined within their context. Uh, the first was, of course, their mission, what they wanted to achieve as an institution. Uh, so their strategy had for OER needed to be aligned with that mission. Um, their strategy needed to be sustainable, and it also needed to be flexible, and that that fits um, well within context because they wanted to have a con they wanted to have that flexibility so that they could move within their context. And finally, um, value added. They needed to show, you know, what's the value? Where's the benefit? Uh, whether it be you know for our students, uh, for our for our instructors, uh, for the organization as a whole. Uh, so those were all things that were included as part of the strategy. 
Now, when I was looking at this, I thought it was interesting um, to also think about the value chain uh, of higher education. And I think um, many of these things are also uh, well aligned with what Andrea talked about in terms of the dimensions, because we're looking at OER from a, from a larger perspective uh, besides just you know, the silo of, of, of teaching and learning. Um, you're looking at the inbound logistics, for example, the OU example was a, was a really good one uh, of how they looked at inbound logistics, they looked at the operations, outbound logistics, uh, marketing and sales, services, where is the value added for OER for all of those different situations, uh, for all of those cases. So that was really what, what, what came out of that research. Um, was looking at, you know, what are some of the best practices, um, things that all of the interviewees said, uh, we need to have champions within the organization, we need to have people that are going to really push, um, push OER within the institution uh, and make, uh, make, you know, really big awareness of campaigns about OER, um, which is, you know, the next point making sure that people are aware of what is OER, what is the role does it play within our organization. Uh, providing faculty incentives was another best practice. And this isn't necessarily money. Uh, what also came up uh, within um, the discussions was uh, faculty um, will also have incentive uh, by, give, by being given opportunities to uh, conduct research and to collaborate with others uh, within or outside of the institution to attend different um, academic uh, uh, conferences to present the results of the work that they've done. The other thing that the institutions um, each did within their strategies is they used their institutional strengths. They looked at, you know, where are we strongest, what can we do uh, to really um, position our strengths and position ourselves within the market. Another um, best practice that they used uh, was design teams, and that was, you know, not having just one person be responsible uh, for, you know, realizing OER, but to have teams of people working together to realize OER. Uh, another best practice, focusing on student-centered learning. How is the best way that we can provide um, OER in, in such a way that we're focused on what do our students uh, need and what kind of outcomes are we trying to realize? And finally, uh, mission and strategy were very key, and that was that the OER strategy aligned uh, well with the mission of the institution. So that's, that's basically it in a nutshell, and I'm sorry for going so quickly. <coughs> well, I'm a little bit worried about your time. Thank you very much. Time was perfect. And I, I personally could read also those uh, sentences in black uh, over dark uh, background, so that, that, that's quite good. Um, I see a couple of questions here um, by Alan. Uh, did UMOOC find it easy to find appropriate OER instead of textbooks? Um, it's been challenging. Um, I, I, I will have to say that some some of the topics it was easier to find um, to, to find OER. Uh, some courses were already using OER in terms of you know making uh, gathering knowledge sources uh, from the internet. Uh, but I would say in general. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was challenging. Let's just let's just put it that way, Alan. Um, what what they did have was the library did a first search and they went through. Oh gosh, I think we had Excel spreadsheets that were you know 30, 40 pages long that would identify potential OER. So it gave instructors an opportunity to look through that that list and then identify it and and add to it in terms of OER that they could use. So they really used the library as a resource in that case. Okay, I see Andrea is typing a question. Uh, well, no, it, um, it was an answer by Foreba. So I have a question myself. You said that uh, uh, Atabasca, uh, more than, a trans than an official strategy, has a sort of a transverse, transversal support in attitude. That is also what um, Rory McGrill was telling me. In fact, they, I mean, but this on one side is pretty good because it leaves more flexibility for 
for, for the, the people within the institution. I'm thinking of Blazenka and Antonia, for example, you know, they don't have to do exactly what the university is telling them to do. That might be a bit uh, problematic. But on the other side, this is uh, not uh, maybe uh, obliging the whole institution to change. So if, I don't know if you, if you can comment on this and at the same time on the importance of the team work. You mentioned a few times the, the creation of teams and I'm telling this because I did a similar uh, case study and I'm, I will share it with you later on uh, the University of South Africa on UNISA, which had the very famous uh, OER mm. strategies in the past. I talked to the responsible person there and the problem there was the sustainability of the strategy itself uh, because it was practically linked to a couple of persons, a decision maker and the manager. When these two persons, for whatever reason, had to you know, slow down, change job, uh, start a PhD, whatever, the strategy slowed down also, not because of a change in the political willingness of the institution, that's what I heard, but just because of this, the practicalities of having a few people involved. Whilst maybe the teams, uh, the creation of design teams could be, also maybe management teams could be a solution. What do you think? Okay. Uh, well, the first question that you asked was about Athabasca University, and I do want to add that, again, context plays a really important role here because with, within Canada, um, it, they have really, really um, loose uh, copyright laws. So you can use quite a bit of what's already out there without having to worry about the copyright issues. Um, so there's been something of a challenge really getting faculty to agree to using um, OER because they're kind of like, well, I can already use what's already out there, so why should I, um, you know, why should I create more OER? Because that's what they're trying to do. Uh, they just want, basically, they want to have packaged courses that are given to them. Um, whereas that's not the case uh, in the United States, if you look at the UMUC example. Uh, so I think that in, in that particular case, um, your strategy or how you approach OER really has to align with, um, with you know, your context and what, and, and really what the, the, the context is that your institution is, is, is trying to, um, to realize uh, OER. Um, your other question about teams, um, this also, like I mentioned, also came up quite often within uh, the interviews uh, because each of them did use teams and teams are important uh, not just from the perspective of creating the OERs, but as you were mentioning, making aware, uh, you know, promoting OER, uh, making others aware of, of OER within the organization. Uh, champions were really important within each of the um, organizations that I spoke with because they needed to, uh, you needed to have champions because they are the ones that are going to push OER within the organization. But then you also need the leadership support to promote and support champions because, as you mentioned, um, champions, I mean, they burn out. I mean, if they are, you know, being given this responsibility, uh, very quickly it will become overwhelming. And so there needs to be kind of a ripple effect within the institutions. Uh, where the champions are, are promoting awareness but supporting the development of new champions to take their places. Uh, so it's, it's really, it's an ongoing, I mean, any, any time there's change within an organization, you're going to need, um, you know, teams of people, you're going to need leadership and management support, and you're going to need your champions and you need to support. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question by Andrea uh, on the OU UK. How does the future learn feature into this uh, OER strategy? Uh, future learn is separate from open learn. Now I talked to the guys at open learn and, and, and not we future learn gets a lot of press, I think, for the work that it does in terms of MOOCs. Um, what open learn is trying to do is it's trying to integrate all of OER, not just the MOOC, into creating environments where um, they're channeling students uh, from informal learners into becoming formal learners, and they're using OER in order to do that. Um, I could go into tons of detail about this, um, and uh, I did publish for um, Eden, I put something in about what o the OU UK is, is doing, and I can send you more information if you'd like, Andrea. Thank you. That was, in fact, a tricky question. Thank you for coming out uh, in such, a, um, such a, an elegant way, I would say. 
So we have uh, 20 minutes more. Thank you very much again, uh, Lisa. We should now move to Alan Tate. Well, I think most of us know Alan uh, from his trajectory. Uh, here he's under the Open University UK. I think he's well, he was professor there for many years. And um, I don't know the multiple heads uh, of Alan. I won't go in detail about the multiple heads of Alan, but I think he's a, a perfect speaker for the to, to discuss the macro level, the policy level, not being a, a policymaker himself, I mean, not being working in the ministry. In fact, uh, uh, the third level is the level of policy, so the top-down level, uh, policy uh, in our understanding here means many things, can be governmental policy, can be local policy, can be funding schemes, uh, any kind of stimulus that can come from above, uh, typically, to change things uh, towards openness within an institution. So I think Alan has the perfect uh, vision to discuss this uh, from a point of view of a non-policy uh, poli professional. I don't know how to say it, uh, but uh, I think it was understood. Uh, Alan, the floor is yours and the screen also, if you can uh, appear. Thank you very much indeed. Let me just click on this. Thank you very much indeed, Fabio, um, uh, and uh, good afternoon to colleagues across the network. Um, I want to reflect, first of all, um, by way of introduction, um, give you a little summary of what I want to, to say, and then, then try and give you some more detail. Uh, we can use the term policy, of course, at institutional level, but that's been dealt with very effectively by colleagues, uh, including Lisa, just before me. Um, so I'm going to reflect now on the macro level of policy, that is to say primarily national or provincial um, level policies, or indeed um, intergovernmental organisation policies such as the European Union, opening up education, which Andrea has already talked about, or indeed UNESCO's on sustainable development goals, which also talk about open education. And just to give you my conclusions in advance so you can reflect on them, um, what I'm going to suggest is that the um, achievement of policy is firstly very important, but secondly very partial, very limited. It's been limited across the field of open education, so some parts of open education have quite well-developed policies at national level, certainly, um, but some parts not at all. But it's also limited um, in depth, that is, it's limited in what it actually can achieve um, in terms of law. Um, so I'm going to take a rather a critical perspective of where we've got to on policy, but at the same time I want, want to emphasise that I believe policy is the level which we all ought to be working towards. So actually those of us who are working um, with open education in, in all its variety, in projects uh, and in institutions, should be looking to how we can get this incorporated into policy at national or regional or provincial level. So let's just reflect for a second what we mean by the word policy. It's got a number of levels of meaning. First of all, it can mean a sort of state, a statement of intent, what we propose to do, and that can lead to a course of action. So these are the things we're going to do to deliver that intent. Uh, policy is usually delivered by strategy, and we've heard colleagues talking already um, today about strategies. Through some sort of operational plan, and it's supported by funding. But the difference, I think, with policy at macro level is that this is then implemented through regulation or protocol, or it's incorporated into law. It's in somehow got some official standing. So it becomes, in a sense, a mandatory set of actions uh, when it becomes policy at national or international level. It's incorporated into law. Now, why is this important? Uh, and I think it's important for reasons which Lisa was beginning to um, discuss, which is that the project level of work, which has been the predominant level of work for open education up till now, is very fragile. It's fragile because projects depend on grants, they come into existence, they give out of existence. Um, projects depend on people for limited periods, they come and work on their projects and they disappear. And so project level work is an important stage in innovation, but if it doesn't move into policy, it leaves an issue, it leaves a set of practices like open education very vulnerable 
to being time limited and to not becoming sustainable. So I think policy is a crucial part of open education practices becoming sustainable. And that's why I'm concerned that I think it is, to be critical, um, only partially um, successful at policy level so far. So just to continue my introduction briefly, um, projects, of course, can move towards policy through micro, meso and macro level. That's one way in which policy is created. It starts with projects and then moves upwards. Or um, it can move the other way. So we can see, have something brought into law, which is then implemented, uh, must be implemented um, at the meso and micro level. Or there can be, and I think this is the best way, uh, it can develop into a sort of synergistic relationships where we have policies and projects being innovative, being mutually supportive. But all of this, of course, if we're talking about policy, we're talking about a political process. And I think we have to accept that we need to move more towards a political process to get policy uh, adopted at the national and international level. So um, there's a wide field here when we talk about open education, and I think much of this has been covered. We're talking about open education, and we're talking about open practices, so actually doing things. We've got open education publishing, which is very influential, um, has been for a number of years now, has had real impact where we've seen the cost of academic publishing lowered. Um, of course, Eden runs an open access journal, uh, open uh, uh, Urodl. There are other open access journals in our field too, um, very importantly. Um, so I think open education publishing uh, has uh, achieved real status uh, and is embedded in projects mostly at um, uh, uh, institutional level. Um, although um, I would say that um, in terms of research, management of research uh, quality in the UK, we have seen at governmental level policies which uh, uh, demand that research which is funded by public funds must be made available through open access publishing. So we have seen open publishing reinforced by governmental policy. Uh, and very sensible is too. Um, open textbooks, um, uh, Lisa has covered, I think there are some other examples which I, I, I will mention around the ways in which this has been moved into policy. Open education resources, I think I must say this is one of the weaker areas where we are limited so far. Discussion, I may learn myself from discussion that, that, that I don't have a full view of this, but I think open education resources have been limited uh, to project-based work and not delivered into um, policy. MOOCs may be something critical to say there, but underlying all of this, if you open education, has been the digital revolution over the last 20 years, both as a, an enabler to make open education practices possible and now driving for change. And the last thing I want to cover is this um, paradox that while we have an increasingly commoditized society we have in open education, an anti-commoditization movement. And I think for governments, this is very difficult because governments, for the most part, adopt um, policies which support the commoditization of products, but find themselves challenged by this anti-commoditization ideology, which they find difficult to accept and to put into policy. So open publishing. And I think we have seen a movement here from projects starting um, as long as 15 or 20 years ago into, through collaboration, into policy. So as I've mentioned, the res research councils in the UK um, now have policy in place, which demands well, the terminology used here, gold and green roots. That is that um, authors and institutions and journals must commit to some level or other of open access publishing, either immediately or, or after a period of one year. Um, and it is now a, a commitment for research that is publicly funded, as I say, that it must become in due course um, publicly available. Um, and uh, this seems to me to be uh, something which began as a radical idea, and certainly the publishers were very unhappy about it, to becoming a common sense notion that um, the old model where academics gave their publications free to private publishers then universities paid, and sometimes paid a great deal, uh, to buy that content back was uh, was not a good model at all, was not a fair model at all. 
Um, we have um, in open archives. Um, again, some of these held at national level. Um, uh, uh, a reflection in policy, driven by policy, um, that um, archives must become open for public research. And, and that's important also for citizen science, as well as for professional academic science, that citizens can now access archives um, in order to interrogate them and to, 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 to do their own research. We have open access journals. We know them in our field. These have become incorporated um, into policy at institutional level and also um, by professional associations. So I think we can be reasonably satisfied on the open publishing side that we have much more than projects. We have open publishing reflected at policy level. Open textbooks, I think there are other colleagues here who are more expert in this than me, but I will mention one example at provincial level in Canada where the province has said, so that is a form of regional government, an important form of regional government in Canada, that they do not want to pay for commercially produced textbooks at, at secondary, post-secondary level, that they are seeking to move their post-secondary institutions to using um, uh, open textbooks, open education resources instead, in just the same way that Lisa described happening at institutional level at UMUC. This is, I think, a minority practice so far. There are relatively few governmental policies here in open textbooks, but I think British Columbia provides at least one important example uh, of open access work becoming more than a project, and it may be that colleagues um, in the network today can provide uh, other examples of open textbooks being, worked, uh, being supported at policy level too. Open education resources, which perhaps has had the most rhetoric over the last 10 years, and there's a huge number of open education resources. In fact, I think the volume of open education resources has itself become problematic. Um, but I would say critically that open education resources has not been supported at policy level nationally or internationally yet. It remains at the level of um, uh, rhetoric, positive, progressive, good rhetoric, but has not been um, incorporated at policy level. Things like Open Learn, which Lisa has mentioned, has something over 5 million visitors per year. Uh, so this is the, uh, um, open the OER run from the, from the Open University, so enormous um, numbers of visitors um, um, reflected in the institutional policy. But if funding, for example, changed radically for the Open University because of uh, national funding challenges, uh, something like Open Learn might um, suffer and become vulnerable. So I would say with OERs, innovative projects supported by progressive rhetoric have actually so far run ahead of outcomes and that they're not supported adequately by national or international policy. Um, I would be interested to hear if there is a different perspective on that. So I think OER is somewhere we, we ought as actors in the field to seek to get the use of OER more adequately reflected in national and international policy. Again, MOOCs, um, well discussed already today. Um, I, I won't um, talk about these more here, but I think still significantly at the level of projects and innovation and very limited incorporation into national policy. So in other words, I don't see national governments saying to universities, you will use MOOCs in order to reduce costs. I see universities still experimenting with MOOCs with all the um, volatility and the fragility that that level of innovation, important though it is, um, uh, risks when MOOCs are not adopted into policies at national level. And so, um, in conclusion, um, I'd also say that um, we have this very fascinating dimension of open education across that range of dimensions of open education practices where what has become in some fields very much a commoditized set of practices is being pushed back as a common, as a place of common ownership, common use, and open access. I think, frankly, the way in which research used to be published was a scandal, um, and the cost of higher education in North America and in England, um, uh, again, forms part of this anti-commoditization um, uh, pushback policy-wise. And in some ways, openness and access is inherent in the potential of the web revolution. 
But I think it's very difficult to put anti-commoditization into national policy, because of course, most of us work and live in capital. countries where commoditization has been a major economic and social trend over 500 or more years and so I think we can expect as we seek to try and move open education into national policy we can expect a rough ride a rocky ride and we can expect challenges ourselves for example publishers are influential major actors in the business world some aspects of the open access movement are uh, very uh, uh, antipathetic to what publishers want. It challenges their business model. Uh, and I think we can find the anti-commoditization dimension of open education practices um, challenging to put into national policy level. So, um, just to finish, I think, it, however, it remains important, whatever the difficulties that we seek to move projects into policy level. Projects are vulnerable to short-term financing, they're vulnerable to exhaustion by both, both financially and by people. Um, policy drives and confirms sustainability. So if we want to make open education in all its variety sustainable, it seems to me essential uh, that we uh, embody it in policy at national and international level. Um, EU and UNESCO both have important policy dimensions in this field but I'm not sure that they are adequate to provide the sustainability at national level that we need. I think both UNESCO and perhaps EU um, provide policy, but it can be ignored by national governments, both in the EU, because education is not part of the, the, the acquis communautaire, which remains the national level responsibility, and because of UNESCO, of course, UNESCO works at an advisory, not a mandatory level. We have important institutional policies policy at national level supported by funding um, remains lacking with the possible exception of the publication of research uh, within some countries at least including the UK. So I think until we move more into the political dimension of in, uh, incorporating our policy, our, 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 our projects and our innovations into policy level, we risk exhaustion by innovators and we risk philanthropic foundations like the Hewlett Foundation, which Lisa mentioned, which has been so supportive of open education, they may move on to the next new thing. We may find open education. Thank you very much, Alan, language. in fact, uh, for this uh, for So this we have overview. And uh, the good thing, well, the, the good thing is that despite we, have, we are almost over with our time, uh, part of the discussion I wanted to have live uh, went on on the chat. So I don't know if you can, if you want to browse the chat while, while I, I briefly comment on that. I think uh, the, the, the main point in the chat uh, has to do with the, the the process, the, the, the bottom-up process from project to, to strategy through an evaluation and then, and then to policy through another evaluation cycle together with the top-down uh, or at the same time with the top-down uh, uh, approach that typically is the one that policy follows. So this uh, dichotomy is um, uh, always present, I would say, and among the comments uh, we had one saying that we should have policy makers with us all the time. I don't know if this would be good especially on the day of the election of Donald Trump. And, uh, and the, the, um, the other one is that leadership, and this is, I think, a pretty important comment, institutional leadership is key because, in fact, the meso level is there in, in the middle and typically uh, as institutional leaders are able to, to, to talk to policymakers or to reach somehow, maybe through association, the, the policy level. Uh, so basically, I would like uh, to um, to get your view on this cycle from project uh, that, that is project evaluation, strategy evaluation, policy, and back. Do you think do you see this as a researcher's uh, dream or as something that uh, maybe somehow has been working, has worked, or could be thought for the future?
Well, it's 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 to in fact it's a f primarily to you and then to the other speakers. If uh, Andrea, Blazenka, Lisa, if you can come up with your uh, with your video for the final, I would say five minutes uh, discussion, five to ten minutes discussion. Even if you are a bit out of time, I invite you to turn on your camera and to to let us have your your view on this uh, cycle. Let's say the, uh, of course related to open me, education, um, all the issues that the we have heard, Mariala, I mean the, the role of publishers uh, and the uh, anti anti commodification and all these uh, let's say principal issues which are pretty important. So how do you see? Well, I would like to start with Alan. How do you see this uh, this process uh, from the project to the policy and back, sort of, and the importance of leadership at all levels. Um, well, I, I, I think it's this is a hugely important area. So, um, first of all, I think the research dimension is enormously helpful. Andrea mentioned that she, she and her team are going to begin some research in this area. But I'd also say to educationalists who are perhaps less familiar and less comfortable with acting in political spheres, that it is naive of us if we want to have open education become a sustainable set of practices. Any other view? I'm especially interested in Blazenka's view because you represent them in here, the micro level. So my question before, how did your your university react to what you have been doing? Actually, I'm, I'm uh, here at the micro level, but uh, I was uh, from the 2010 to, to, to 2014 a vice rector at the University of Zagreb with 80,000 students. So I can compare these two positions. Um, just for but if I look at my school right now, where, where I'm a professor, I, I can say that we are uh, uh, we have a policy and strategy to support this kind of um, uh, especially blended learning approach and using open uh, online resources. And each course do have this e-course in learning management system and so on. So so it's quite uh, let's say a comfortable position for a professor and researcher. But looking at um, this meso level and university level. It is not so favorable because even though we have a um, strategy that is um, that was adopted 2014, uh, right now we don't have any financial support or any recognition for those who are working on in developing or some kind of innovation in a uh, arena of using e-learning or uh, open educational resources. So we have this, let's say, on university level, we have this. Um, gap between the strategy and what's written and adopted and what we are acting, uh, what's actually the, the reality. And um, also what I mentioned before in my comment, it's very important to have this continuity. So if we have a strategy and if in the meantime something is changing in leadership or in rector presidency and so on, that we can, we can follow up the strategy that was adopted at one time or to change the strategy. Otherwise, what, uh, what Lisa, Lisa mentioned before, we can have really nice papers on the shelves, but if we don't have uh, uh, funding or um, a real action in place, that uh, it can be, it, it's just, um, it, it, it is, um, it's not very comfortable position, especially for, for students who are counting what, what they can read, but finally what they get, it, it is not, not according to the to the strategy, but something that is let's say let's say lower level of policy. Thank you very much, Andrea. You want to say something? Yeah, I I would like to to make a comment if I may. I like your perspective, Alan, of dealing uh, with open education in this more global way as I I presented initially. But in terms of uh, of policy, we normally see more action or let's even say activism in relation of having OER policies. No, perhaps because uh, it's a very popular issue. It's I don't know, it relates to copyright, etc. So there's a lot of activism in that area, and UNESCO seems to be focusing 
own the open, open education resources part of open education, in, in my view. Um, but I think that perhaps we could um, uh, try and look, look at it more globally and even think amongst ourselves what other policies could we be thinking at a more high level in terms of the other dimensions as well? I agree with you that there is a lack of policies. This is something we've been seeing in our research today that Fabio and his team is participating. But also in terms of the Commission, it's not only difficult to be more precise, I'm just putting my own perspective, but I also think there is a lack of evaluation of impact from all of what the Commission is already doing. For example, if we think in terms of the Erasmus program, um, there is so, many, so much money invested in that, uh, and all the content all produced by the Erasmus Plus program should be made available as an open license resource. And I, I personally don't know uh, if there ever has been an evaluation of the impact of this whole huge program, which involves so much money which is some sort of, to me, an indirect policy, you know. So I think that when we discuss policies also, we, we should think about what types of policies are we talking about. Institutional, national, um, and cross-border, which is the case of the EU, although to me I see it as an indirect policy embedded into the Erasmus program. Um, and indeed, we need to discuss it further, much further. Thank you very much. Uh, Lisa, any comment? I see you, you, were, you were mentioning that uh, this top-down, bottom-up dynamic is present in your case studies. Can you deep elaborate? Yeah, in all of the case studies that I looked at, there was, you know, the, these, these movements sometimes started at the top, other times they started, you know, with pockets of innovation. But in, in all of the cases, um, they were supported by management, so you had the top-down um, support. Um, and then you also had, you know, faculty and, and members of the institution that were involved. Um, I'd like to say something about the policy um, comments that have been made so far. I, I couldn't agree more about the need for policy. Um, but I think also, uh, you know, just taking, for example, uh, Bologna, I mean, how Bologna has been implemented and realized within the EU, uh, I think partially, uh, you know, we get these policies and it's really up to institutional leadership uh, to determine how are we going to realize these and how are we going to make them sustainable um, within our organizations. And a lot of times we have to sit back and we have to look at it from a, um, of a, ver from a, a holistic perspective from, you know, the, from the bottom and from the top and involve all of the key stakeholders in order to come up with solutions that will make, these, uh, make our strategies uh, sustainable and to realize policy. That's Thank you very much. I see a couple, well, yeah. It, uh, I mean, the adoption of Bologna, I think, is a good example on how policy can be interpreted, I would say, by different, not only by different countries, but by different institutions within the same country. So, absolutely. And I like very much the, the, the concept of indirect policy or the way I call them are incentives, like in the Erasmus Plus. As far as I know, I was reading the, the interim evaluation report of the first report in Erasmus Plus. And that dimension was not, as far as I remember, analyzed in depth. Mm -hmm. uh, also because, you know, it's uh, one thing is to put an open license, one thing is to make sure that uh, all these uh, results are findable and, uh, and, you know, people know they are there. That's the main, the main issue, especially with the European project, as, as we all know. Uh, we have a comment by Blazenka who would like to stress the evaluation impact of policy, but also to evaluate initiative via action research, which is absolutely fundamental. I mean, it's a, in an ideal world, I would say, actual research should inspire policy. I mean, this would be the, 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 the bottom-up movement. Of course, we don't want uh, teachers or, or rectors to do the national policy, but that should be a source of inspiration. Now, I don't know how much this, uh, uh, how much this works. And then Christina, uh, she is uh, promoting the um, transforming universities for the digital ages, digital age policies, business models, and resources webinar, which is starting about, uh, which is about to start, in fact, uh, in another conference room. So, if you still have some energy to discuss uh, uh, universities in the digital age, this is uh, happening very soon. Pretty important, in fact. Uh, Whilst I'm asking for, for comments, I think uh, I, I'm not, uh, I don't think it's, um, 
we are in the position to, 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 to draw conclusions, otherwise uh, we would be a bit uh, um, over ambitious. I think what we, what we, can, uh, uh, what we can state is that, uh, the, in my understanding at least, the three levels should stay there as, um, as approaches, so the micro is very important, the meso, of course, in the strategy is fundamental, and the policy is there. What we are finding is that uh, sometimes uh, um, there, is, there are bilateral communication between, these two, between two of these levels, which works, like in the case of Lazenka. In other cases, you have, you know, uh, um, a, an open or an, uh, an open to innovate or policy maker within a university that can uh, facilitate the growing of some inno innovative practices, some open practices. And in some cases, you have, as we are seeing in the study. With, uh, with JRC, some uh, very isolated cases where national policies are inspired by associations, for example, of universities, of rectors, and so on. So you have some cases, some, I would say, rather unfortunately isolated cases where these bilateral uh, elevators work between policy and, and strategy and between strategy and, uh, and uh, micro, so the, the daily work. I think the challenge would be how to make this uh, uh, the norm instead of the exception. But this is uh, this would be my last question for you. Uh, if you have one bright idea, one sentence on what should uh, the Commission, uh, national government, and institutional leaders do to foster this, to make this happen simply more, you know, good cases exist. Uh, and uh, the, the strategies presented by Lisa Marie show that when you have a clear vision and you have the, the time and the, the patience to implement it, it works. Uh, any last, uh, any flash comment on how this could uh, become more the norm than the exception? Yeah, what, I, what I put into my comment is that um, uh, what is really important to open communication between, between these three levels, because if we just have, now we, we have it, but, and it, now we see how it is easy is when we have examples and we have a, a micro, meso, uh, or um, at the highest level, but Usually we have conferences just for practitioners, researchers, then um, uh, people that are running universities, and then the policy level people. And very rarely we can find it um, at one place, at one time, or projects that um, actually incorporated actions for for all three levels. And, and I think that's actually the role of, of Eden is really important, and this kind of a webinars or other discussions. or but it's not discussion, just discussion, but also project that uh, uh, take into account all three levels. Thank you very much. Alan, do you have a view on this? Do you have a, the ultimate solution? I don't think I have the ultimate um, answer to, to, to that or indeed to anything else, Fabio. I've been totally wrong about uh, this morning's events in the USA, so I, I think I'll stay quiet for a little while. Um, but but um, what I, I suppose what I what I would say is that I think um, educationalists are happier working at project level, and I think it's that we have to work to change our own practice to look at the policy dimensions of what we do, and then to work together at a broader than project level to ensure that the good that comes out of the whole range of projects, say Thank across... You. Going clockwise uh, to finish with the Eden's vice president with a, an Eden position on this. So, Andrea, do you have a flash idea or a flash wish for this? No, I, I just uh, I just want to say that I, I fully agree with, uh, with Alan in, in terms of uh, thinking of this bottom-up approach for policy making because um, Eva, for example, asked me, um, do you know of any universities that are using the framework you presented, etc.? And I say, well, there may be, but if they don't tell us, we won't know. Uh, likewise, um, 
big projects normally run uh, with EU money or national money, they are always so inspiring and, and fantastic in, in uh, gather, gathering together experiences and data. And I think this all needs to be very well communicated to policymakers because they need to know that the money they put towards a certain action actually bring something in return and, and, and they need to know it clearly and very often um, this is not done, at least not as much as I'd like to see happening. For example, I would like to see an overview of all the EU funded projects and, and you know, lessons learned from this over, I don't know, two or three years' time. It's very difficult in terms of OER, MOOCs, etc. It's very difficult to gather this information to start with. But in terms of an association to think about it, I think it, it could be something very interesting. Okay, to close, Lisa, Eden was mentioned a few times, uh, and I think it's part of the inner mission of Eden to, to facilitate this communication between different levels and these mappings. So I don't want to, to extract from you any promise for future work of Eden, but I think this is a confirmation of the commitment that is clearly there, no? Yeah, I think the confirmation of the commitment, confirmation of the role that Eden has within, uh, within Europe, uh, and not just within Europe, but also uh, internationally, uh, as being um, really a, a platform for people to um, to come together to to communicate and discuss the issues that we've discussed today at all different levels, um, and you know work together to find solutions. So, yeah, that's my plug for Eden. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. I think we closed properly. And uh, with a bit of delay, but that didn't prevent us from having most of the participants still there. So thank you very much for this almost two hours of webinar, which is a pretty, uh, normally is too much for a webinar, but we kept, I think, uh, up with a rather interesting discussion. And uh, the, the, thing, the, the webinar has been recorded, so participants will receive a, a link with that. I'm asking you all to tweet it as much as possible so that others can enjoy this. And I would like to thank the participants first and then our four presenters for your contribution. And uh, see you tomorrow and on Friday for the two remaining uh, webinars of this, this European Distance Learning Week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio.